Hey, everybody. Happy Sunday night. It is a uh, chilly evening in southeast Georgia. Nice night to uh, go and sit on a porch and drink some bourbon. I'm drinking uh, Larceny tonight, in, uh, which is credited to Johnny Fitzgerald uh, in recognition of the QAnon cult. Waiting on John Fitzgerald Kennedy Sr. and Jr. to appear at a rally in Dallas, Texas. Of course, John Fitzgerald Kennedy Sr. would be, I believe, 102, 103, uh, if he were not dead, if he had not been killed in one of the most public deaths in American and or world history. But uh, I thought it was appropriate considering what we're dealing with and in part what we're talking about tonight in a uh, conversation that uh, touches on such important subjects such as Big Bird, Josh Howley, whatever in the hell it is that he's doing, uh, and the Republican Party, of course, uh, maintaining their political power through conspiracy theories and absolute nonsense and fear mongering. So we have a lot to go through tonight, but I thought that was a, a hat tip to uh, what we're doing. So cheers. Good to see everyone. I hope we're dealing with the time change in a decent manner. Hanging out, it's a little bit, um, yeah, we can get into the dipshit Aaron Rodgers. Absolutely, we can. I want to think, uh, or I want to say that the Aaron Rodgers thing is pretty incredible. Uh, if you remember a couple of months ago, Aaron Rodgers was a contender to take over as host of Jeopardy, which there's an alternate reality out there where Aaron Rodgers was named the host of Jeopardy and this thing happened. And then, uh, of course, came out and said that he was getting his medical advice to take ivermectin from uh, Joe Rogan. Uh, it just goes to show you that perceptions in this country uh, are a little rough. A little rough. And a lot of what we are dealing with in the United States of America at the current moment are illusions. And not just illusions, but like poorly manufactured and maintained illusions that just sort of fall apart the moment that you start uh, pulling at the threads. So yeah, the Aaron Rodgers thing, I think, was a pretty good metaphor for exactly what is happening in this country. Uh, it's it, it never ceases to amaze me how these things uh, come together and what they do. But yeah, I hope everyone's dealing with the time change. All right. Uh, it currently feels like it's roughly midnight uh, I, as I've gotten older. That has been one of those things that when the time shifts, uh, the, um, uh, the rhythms get thrown off. Uh, enjoyed the extra hour of sleep because I've been having to get up uh, incredibly early to try and uh, work on the current book project, which is just, whew, it's a lot. Uh, I'm currently in the interwar period between World War One and World War II. Uh, we're going to talk about what I've learned with fascism, uh, which is pretty incredible. The things that I've been finding uh, in this chapter in particular, not just, you know, in previous chapters, but what I've been finding right now with this uh, dive into fascism and, and really, really getting into the... Um, the ideology of it, but also the weaponization, uh, what it does, how it works. Uh, pretty incredible, actually, what I've, what I've been finding and, and, and sort of the way that this has um, crystallized and clarified for me what not only we're going through, but what undoubtedly uh, we are looking at coming forward or going forward. So... Very good seeing you. Glad we're doing this as always. 
it's always nice when it turns a little bit chilly. Get out here, drink some bourbon, warm up, get the jacket and the flannel going. And then get up in the morning and uh, jump into the Spanish Civil War. Can't wait. Susan, I yeah, so Susan asked, can you explain the hypocrisy with fascism? Um, that that is a that is a question that could be its own uh, bourbon talk. <laughs> I mean, that could that could be a series of bourbon talks. Uh, the hypocrisy of fascism is is myriad, it's legion. Uh, first and foremost, fascism, and I know this is going to shock you after the past couple of years, but uh, they lie constantly. Fascists do nothing but lie because the only thing that actually matters to them is the pursuit of power and profit. Um, and, you know, what's funny, actually, Wolf, I just says, who has ever won with fascism? Nobody wins with fascism. There's a moment there's a moment in which the wealthy and the powerful maintain control through fascism, which we'll talk about tonight, but it's a self-destructive ideology. It's all about personal self-destruction and destruction of society. Um, but the hypocrisy, the, the, the hypocrisy at the heart of it, and this is really important, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in a few minutes. Uh, the hypocrisy is that fascism is not just a far right ideology, but because it is in the service of the wealthy and the powerful, what it does, because it's facing calls for reform or populistic uh, revolutionary energies, because it works with the far right, it also bridges over the middle in order to pull people who are upset about the economic conditions and the material conditions. So actually what fascism does is it it is on the far right, but it goes ahead and it sort of fates towards the left in order to take that revolutionary uh, reformist energy, that anger, and then redirects it. Because it should be obviously focused on the wealthy and the powerful who have exploited people and made sure that their living conditions are terrible. But what the fascists do is they say, no, that's not what's actually happened. What's actually happened is that this conspiracy over here, which of course is always Jewish puppet masters, it's always liberal traders on the inside, and it's always uh, people of color who have been brought along you know, in this conspiracy, they take that anger away from the wealthy and the powerful, and then they transfer it over to a vulnerable population. And then they turn the people who are dissatisfied with their living conditions, they turn them against those vulnerable uh, populations. So there's a lot that uh, is going on there. So the, the hypocrisy is, uh, the hypocrisy is, is part of it. It's, it's a massive, massive part of, uh, of fascism. So what would the evangelical role be in any sort of coming fascism? I'll say, I'll say this. Um, I, I, I think, and I've put my marker down on this for a while. Uh, I think any sort of a neo-fascistic movement within the United States is not just going to be couched in American exceptionalism, but I would say that it would probably be the sort of dying embers or sort of the supernova collapse and explosion of American empire. The idea that we're not able to go into other countries and win wars or, you know, sort of uh, push people around. The moment that we start realizing that this thing is starting to fall apart, I think that there will be a reaction on the right. And so what would probably... Yeah, I'll answer that in a second about climate change. Um, I think what you would probably see is much like what we're seeing right now, which is a radicalization of white evangelicals who, um, and I grew up in this. I've talked about this uh, ad nauseum, of course, in my writing and my research, but I grew up being told in white evangelical circles that there was a satanic conspiracy, the new world order, and there was an apocalyptic battle that was coming. And that's the fascist playbook, which is there's an apocalyptic battle between those conspiracies that I was just talking about and the fascists who claim that they are going to be on the side of the Lord or the good or whatever it is that they're claiming at the moment. And white evangelicals have been taught and told 
consistently over and over and over again that they are going to see the apocalypse and they're going to be soldiers for Christ against the satanic experience. Now, somebody somebody asked, like, what do I think fascism would look like with climate change? Well, one of the things that would happen, and this is something that uh, I've been talking about a lot recently, um, as our borders would start to shrink and as resources would start to dwindle, the problems that we're having now are just going to exacerbate. Uh, you know, one of the reasons why we're not in like full scale civil war right now is this is a very big country. And for generations, you know, we have just left. Like I talked about this on a, um, a premium episode of the Muckrake podcast uh, where, you know, the, you, you sort of put fences around and you say you either agree to what's going on here or you leave and you go find your own place in order to fence in and we've reached a point where there's nowhere else to go and eventually there was a period of time where you know you could take over a guam or philippines or something along those lines and that would vent some of the internal frustrations and some of those uh, battle frictions right we don't have that anymore we don't have that availability. In fact, we're losing territory. And as climate change causes those problems and those resources to dwindle, all of our internal conflicts are only going to get worse. And then on top of that, because we have absolutely plundered and abused the global South, you're just going to see more and more refugees that are going to be coming up as you know their political and economic instability uh, is exacerbated by climate change. So they're just going to move up here. And the moment that they come up here or, or you know they come across the ocean or however it is that they show up here, uh, and it might even be refugees from American states going into other states. I mean, you're just going to see basically a collapse of liberal democracy. Those laws that are supposed to hold people in place and those laws that are supposed to navigate our relationships are just going to fall by the wayside and it's going to turn into survival of the fittest and, you know, who can hurt the other person, who can use violence and intimidation and get things across. That's one of the reasons, I mean, besides the fact that we don't want the earth to die and we don't want to be part of like one of the major extinction events in the history of the universe. I mean, that's one of the reasons why we have to deal with climate change. You know, we got to get that taken care of. We got to have some sort of a, of a plan. Let's turn that up a little bit. People are saying it's dark. It's not that dark. I always, I always fall on the side of it being a little bit darker. That's, that's what I've been told. Um, all right, we got, we got a ton of questions tonight. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the stuff that we're talking about right here. Uh, a whole lot of shit. We got, we got some really, really good questions all over the place tonight. Um, first things first, Tim asked, what should we take from the loss in Virginia? First of all, uh, we have been plunged into a political scenario where every single election now is supposed to, uh, you know, either be the end of the world or some sort of commentary on the trajectory of things. Uh, I, I, I said this on the podcast, Terry McAuliffe uh, ran a really bad campaign. And that's not to say that Glenn Youngkin ran a good campaign. He won because he was able to turn the entire conversation about the election into this CRT panic. And so as a result, it became a referendum on CRT and Glenn Youngkin as a warrior against that. And Terry McAuliffe didn't have an answer for it. Terry McAuliffe is an old hand of Democratic Party politics, and he didn't really have it in this election. I mean, he's never been a retail politician, and retail pol politics, of course, means getting out and pressing flesh and talking to people. But he, he wasn't, he, he didn't have an answer. He had no answer for the critical race theory panic. And what the Democratic Party needs to do is twofold. They need to have a plan. The Democratic Party needs to have something that they tell voters that they're going to give them. Now, in this last election, with, with Joe Biden winning and, of course, uh, Ossoff and Warnock uh, winning for the Senate, it was all about getting Trump out. It was all about getting past the current crisis or what was the current crisis at that point. That was the message. 
And, you know, one of the things that actually happened was we saw during the Democratic primary, we saw the Democrats negotiate themselves down. We, we, we talked about that. Like they, they, they started out by talking about free public university and they ended up at community college and then they ended up dropping that completely off the side of the table. Uh, you know, w one of the problems here is that the Democratic Party looked at Donald Trump. They said he is an existential threat. We need to get somebody elected and we need to just go ahead and get in there and try and restore things back to, quote unquote, normal, even though the foundation has rotted out from underneath the house. The Democratic Party needs to have a plan, and the Republican Party has been fantastic on this uh, for years and years and years. Whenever the Republican Party sweeps into office, it's because it promises something, and that promise is always disingenuous. I mean, you take something like the contract with America, and the contract with America was a complete like fraud. It was just about pushing neoliberalism and hyper capitalism and exploitation. Um, you know, it, it, it was a complete lie that Newt Gingrich and the Republicans pushed. The Democrats don't have a set of goals that they can go out and say, if we all get in, if you give us a sweeping mandate, this is what we will do. And on top of that, because they don't have that, the Republicans who have just absolutely lapped them for decades, they're the ones who define the question. The Republican Party always owns the linguistic space. Every time there's an argument about policy or philosophy or the Overton window, the Republican Party dominates it. And the Democratic Party always ends up on their back feet, always apologizing and promising that they're not actually that far left or they're not that liberal or they're not socialist or they're not radicals. So what the Democratic Party needs to do is that they need to have some sort of a promise some sort of a plan or a system at this point and you know i've told everybody that i know who works with biden or around biden like this entire thing you need to make 2023 or 2022 my god where what what is time you need to make 2022 the promise that people like Manchin and Cinema have held this party hostage. And if we get more people in and if we actually move left, then all of a sudden we can start to make things happen. You have to get past those two, plus also the other Democrats who are quietly in the background not wanting to pass anything. Well, if you do that, like you can actually win some offices. But they also need to have an answer on this critical race theory bullshit. And the answer, by the way, is that critical race theory isn't the real problem here. This is a boogeyman, white supremacist, paranoia pandering. It has absolutely nothing to do with critical race theory. But of course, you can't get up in front of the American people and say, this is in law schools here, here, and here, and here, and here. Nobody wants that conversation. Nobody wants to hear it. It doesn't work. There's no like clipped way of doing it. What the Democratic Party needs to do is they need to go back to their old premise, which is telling people, hey, all of this stuff that the Republican Party is telling you right now, it's to ensure that you make less money. It's to ensure that you don't get benefits. It ensures that you are actually going ahead and voting and rallying to hurt yourself. And here are the things that you can get if you come over here. Now, that is a bigger job than nearly anything, and the Democratic Party has not been willing or able to do that for a very, very long time. Uh, but that's what we need to take from it, is that if you want to win some elections, Democrats, you got to make some choices. you got to you got to figure out who you're supposed to be and what you're trying to do. And chasing after imaginary independent voters doesn't work. They're done with you. The people that you think you're chasing think that you are part of a satanic cabal. They think that you're part of a new world order. You're not bringing them back. You need to find some other people and you need to refine your roots. You have to, you, you, neoliberalism needs to die. And the Democrats need to move away from that consensus. They need to offer something new. People don't give a shit about capitalism or socialism or, or a third way or whatever. They just don't want to live in misery anymore. Give them something different. Now, on a similar note, John H. says, Josh Howley is talking about making masculinity a campaign issue. Do you see it working? This is part of this larger idea. 
Now, this quote unquote masculinity crisis, and I wrote a book about it, uh, the man they wanted me to be. Um, there's so much built into this political identity and a lot of what we're talking about here is because that deindustrialization has thrown American men, particularly white American men, into an absolute tizzy and they, they are having a, a complete existential crisis. And what happens when that happens? What happens when all of a sudden they don't make enough money or they don't feel like they have an opportunity to do things or they feel like somehow or another something that they deserve or something that they're entitled to? What do they do? They go towards fascism. That has happened over and over and over again. And the basis of fascism, by the way, are disaffected, entitled young men, particularly young white men. Howley knows that. He's, he's incredibly edu ed educated. Like this entire thing that he's doing is a gambit that he is playing. And going back to what I said about what American fascism or authoritarianism is going to look like, I think he understands that. He understands that when it comes time, in 2023, when all of a sudden he starts running for president of the United States of America, that's going to be his thing. That's going to be his lane. Now, you know, Donald Trump basically plays the exact type of thing, but I guarantee he couldn't explain what it means or what's going on. It's just he has this old swaggering chauvinistic idea of what it means to be a man. The question is, will it work? And the answer is it could. We got to learn from history, which is if you have a bunch of disaffected men, young men, they're going to go to they're going to go to fascism if you don't give them something else. If you don't do something that reinvigorates and you can kill two birds with one stone in this case, you can go ahead and start investing money in trying to make equality happen in this country and give people something to do. Have them out there fixing our infrastructure, have them out there doing public works. This is all stuff that the Republican Party systematically dismantled starting in the 1940s into the 1950s. They killed the New Deal coalition on purpose through the Red Scare by talking about the communist threat and all this bullshit. So is it going to work? Maybe. It could possibly work. I don't think Howley is the guy to pull it off. If somebody is going to do it, it's going to probably be a veteran. It's probably going to be somebody who can come in and say, you know what America needs? It needs military discipline. It needs its, its veterans to come in and figuring out how this stuff should work. Um, back, in, or back after World War I into the fascist era of World War II, they called it a trenchocracy which was the idea that they looked at government and parliamentary procedures and debating laws and all of that stuff. And they said, you know what? That's useless. Liberal democracy is dead. The question is, is somebody going to come out and do that? That's the question. That's the question. Uh, Anthony R. says, do you think people like Glenn Greenwald, Jimmy Dore, and other professed leftists drawing left-leaning voters to right-wing talking points is a modern orchestrated Southern strategy of sorts? I don't think it's intentional. No. I think what has happened is that the rift between the Democratic Party and what we would call the left has absolutely driven some of these people crazy. Um, I wouldn't listen to a single thing that Glenn Greenwald says. I've said this before on another bourbon talk, like... I've talked to enough people who've been around him and worked with him that, um, yeah, that's not somebody that you want to get your news from uh, or your perspectives from. Matt Tybee is the exact same sort of way. Um, Jimmy Dore, I've talked to people who've known him. I think he sees an opportunity for someone to be very, very loud about, quote unquote, leftist politics. But I think that the left, particularly with the Internet and social media, I think there are a lot of people who were pissed off about the status quo, which makes sense who are pushing really, really hard for some sort of an alternative. And as a result, they are finding a lot of room with right-wing people like Tucker Carlson, who will have them on their shows. And they make a lot of money like that. It always ends up having to be, yeah, they're not actually leftist. Yeah, I mean, I don't think any of them actually hold, you know, actual leftist principles. But compared to the Democratic Party and compared to what we consider the quote unquote liberal, you know, left, like, yeah, they 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 have room on the right because the right wants to bring them on in order to criticize Democrats. I mean, it makes a ton of money. 
it's the economic incentives always it's always the economic incentives incentives you always got to look at why the people are doing what they're doing it's that keep democracy says dim's actually got something done are you surprised no i thought that yeah i think when they started getting critiqued by the left they got mad i think that's exactly right um I was not surprised that the Democrats uh, passed this infrastructure bill. Uh, I thought that was always a fait accompli. I, I thought that Mansion was going to bleed this for everything that it was worth, and cinema has made unbelievable amounts of money and political capital by her part in this thing. Uh, it was never going to be a problem for them to pass the infrastructure bill. The question has always been the the safety net stuff. So no, I, I had a um, I, I, I had no doubt that they were going to get this passed. It was going to be a matter of when and it was going to be a matter of what it looked like. Mansion got what he wanted. Mansion got what he wanted. Do I think the infrastructure bill is a red herring? Uh, I don't think it's necessarily a red herring. I think it moves attention away. And I think this is one of the things that uh, the progressives are really, really pissed off about, which I'll talk about in just a second. Uh, I, I think that there are a lot of people involved in the infrastructure bill who, who think that they did a good job here. Uh, but it is very much about saying that this is something that we did. But it also gives a bunch of money to established people and people who already have money and power. I mean, it, it, it basically was, you know, a gift in a lot of ways. But in other ways, um, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I don't think that this was a generational bill. I don't think that this is going to change the world. I don't... I. I think that this is a drop in the bucket of decades and decades and decades, 40 years of non-investment in necessary things. James, James says, I'm a veteran. I wouldn't equate military discipline with Republicans. Absolutely not. I mean, that's what the Republicans have done. I mean, my God, every single day it was talking about you got to respect the troops and salute the flag and all this stuff. And the moment that anybody said anything in the military that they didn't care for or a veteran didn't care for, immediately they threw them under the bus. They got behind Donald Trump so quick after he talked shit about John McCain. They don't care about the military at all. The only thing that they care about with the military is that the military will go where they want them to go and kill who they want them to kill and secure which oil fields they want to, them to secure. That's all they care about. They don't actually care about the military. It's a tool. It's a tool. And they don't like it when the tool talks back. Now, to go along with this, I got two questions that go together, and this goes along with what we're talking about. First was defend trans rights. Do you understand why the Democratic Progressive Caucus in the end gave up their position on blocking the bill? I feel like they gave up their only leverage to get a social spending package through. Did they get played? And then America says, what are your thoughts on the infrastructure bill just passed? Isn't a total cave-in to last-term mansion and one-term cinema? I don't believe it has major provisions supporting equity, equality, and renewable energy. Where are the chances of passing the rest of the agenda? Now, for those of you who uh, aren't subscribed to the Muckrake Podcast Patreon, which you should be, patreon.com slash Muckrake Podcast. Uh, I talked to Nick uh, last week for the last episode. It might have been the episode before. It might have been the episode before. What is time? Uh, I had talked on the phone with uh, a staffer from a certain progressive representative. I don't want to give too much away because I don't want to burn my contacts and sources. Uh, I was talking with a staffer from the Progressive Caucus, and what I got told is that this was a long-term negotiation. Um, Nancy Pelosi got thrown out of the Progressive Caucus. Um, there are feelings that going into um, the midterms and going into 2024 that a lot of progressives feel like that they are gaining enough strength that they're going to primary a lot of people. They're going to get reinforcements who are going to come in and tow the progressive line. In this case, 
it was a feeling, and this is something that I heard almost verbatim from somebody within the Democratic strategic body, that the bleeding needing st needed stopped. There had to be some kind of a quote unquote win because that's what the media requires, right? At this point, there had to be some sort of a stick in the spoke of the media narrative because the main story, of course, has been the idea that Joe Biden has failed, the idea that Joe Biden's presidency is destroyed and that the Democrats can't get something done, particularly after Virginia. The thing that happened here was that the bleeding needed to be stopped. Uh, the Progressive Caucus was given one promise after another that the uh, social safety net bill was going to get passed if they went ahead and passed the infrastructure bill. Now, originally, if you remember, they were supposed to be paired because the progressives did not trust the moderates or the what you would call like rank and file Democrats to go ahead and pass it if they went ahead and passed the infrastructure bill first. If it doesn't get passed, if it gets shelved, and what's supposed to happen this week, of course, is we're supposed to hear budgetary concerns. There's supposed to be a report that talks about how much it's going to cost or how much it's going to run up in the deficit, which, by the way, is all completely fictional because none of this stuff means anything. In this case, the progressives have been promised that this is going to get passed. Now, I have to tell you, I don't necessarily believe that promise. I don't. And I don't think that they do either. The people that I've talked to are very wary of this. And this, to a lot of them, feels like a, you know, shame on you, shame on me type situation. If the moderates and the rank and file Democrats go ahead and torpedo this, uh, you know, social safety net provision, it's going to get really ugly really fast. And I think you're going to see the primary machine sort of go in to overdrive. I And I don't know exactly what that would look like right now. Uh, the people that I've talked to think that they could, you know, poach a few seats. They, they think that they could take some people and possibly put, you know, the fear of God into some of them. Um, but I do not feel, from my conversations and what I've heard, I don't feel like the progressives are screwing around anymore. I, I think that this is a new generation of politicians. I don't think that they're just going to get punched in the mouth and say, thank you. I don't, I don't, I don't see that happening. So if I had to put, if I had to put money on it right now, I'd, I'd say it's 50, 50 on the social safety bill. So social safety net bill. Um, that's, I think it's a coin flip, but if they go ahead and they screw over the progressives on this, I, 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 I think it's going to get ugly very, very quickly. Very, very quickly. I, I think that, and, and I told everybody, I, I, when Biden got elected, I said, what is the possibility of, of what this might look like? I said, demolition derby, and that the Democratic Party is going to have, you know, its own little civil war over the next couple of years. And I think that, you know, social safety net goes down if it isn't actually voted on. I mean, that's, that's pretty rough. That'd be pretty rough at this point. So that's, uh, that's where I'm at. I would I would say it's a coin flip at this point. And and if it doesn't happen, it was uh, it'd be rough. Jake H, is it just me or does this feel like the garden bed of some sort of upheaval or people movement? Uh, whatever comes through a prolonged fascist period comes first is scary. I completely agree. The thing that I think when people think about momentous change, I think that we sort of have a fantasy that it can happen without conflict and it can happen without suffering. And I don't, I don't think that's true. Um, I think even if there is a leftist movement, even if there is a people's movement, even if there is a grassroots uprising of some type, and it certainly feels as if that is a possibility at this point, um, that doesn't mean that there's not going to be violence or bloodshed, which is what I've sort of thought was coming along for a long time. Because, again, the wealthy and the powerful turn to fascist. They turn to neo-fascist. They turn to paramilitary groups in order to make sure that people are getting their skulls cracked and they think twice before they go out and, um, and protest. I would say it's not 1933 Germany. I would say it's more like... 
Uh, let me see. That would be right at the end of World War One. It'd be right at the moment where you have a German revolution. Yeah, I, I, yeah, whatever happens, it's going to be rough. I got to tell you. And that's one of the things I keep saying, which is we have to steal ourselves. I, I said, I'm trying to remember around what time it was. And, and this is something that I haven't said in a while, but I need to reiterate, which is you need to figure out you as, 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 as a citizen, you as a person need to figure out like what what is it that you want and what are you prepared for because what we're going through right now feels awful it is it is a depressing thing it's an anxious making thing and by the way it doesn't help of course that authoritarianism uses anxiety and psychological tor uh, terror to wear you down but it's it's going to be different in the near future. Like, I, I don't think that there's going to be just a, 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 a cooling down. I don't think we're going to downshift. All of the factors in play right now show us that we're heading, we're not just in a crisis, we're heading towards compounded crises. And this moment that we're living in, we're alive. And we're adults at a really important time in American and world history. I, I, I was laughing about this the other day, talking with uh, some of my students. And, you know, my students, I, I, I tell them, I said, I, I grew up, I'm 40 years old. I grew up uh, in the age of Reagan and the supposed, you know, zenith of the American century or whatever. I saw what we were promised America was going to be like which was strange because now I can see what America is actually becoming. We are in a weird position with our ages when we were born and where we are right now. The question is, what are we going to see happen? Because things are changing. Things are changing in a big, big way. And we're going to see those things come to fruition. So again, the question is, what do you want? And what are you prepared for? And we're going to need to be prepared for a lot. That's, that's, the, that's the honest truth. And I can't, I can't peddle unreasonable hope. I don't think that that's ethical. But we are watching these things come to fruition in our lives and, and in our world right now, which we could talk about that for hours, but we need to be prepared for that. Chrissy says, now that Biden got a win, what do you foresee the right's reaction being? Are we talking usual roads of communist nonsense or violence since that guy in Ohio said the quiet part loud? Yeah, no shit. Um, in this case, I think... Um, I, 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 I think you'll probably see with the media, they'll treat this as a win, um, you know, for for a minute or two. I think the Republican Party is going to jump on this CRT horse and ride. I mean, there's no reason for them not to until the Democratic Party can figure out something else. And meanwhile, all of the pundits and the tastemakers and the pundit class and the political class and the strategists, all of them are going out of their way to tell people of color and marginalized people, trans people, uh, LGBTQ people, they're telling them, you need to pipe down. Like, we get it. We get that you're upset. And we think you deserve something better, too. But you're hurting our election chances. And so probably what you're going to see um, over the next couple of months is probably going to be the Republican Party doubling down on conspiracy theories. Shocking. I know. And these cultural battles. Um, and you're probably going to see the Democratic Party sort of... <sighs> not understand how to deal with this stuff and continue to refuse to call this the threat that it is. So yeah, you're going to hear a lot of talk about communism and socialism as these plans are brought into fruition, particularly if the social safety net stuff passes. I mean, that's that'll get ugly really, really quickly. Um, and James Carville needs to go away. He absolutely does need to go away. He doesn't even want to do this anymore. 
James Carville isn't even interested in actually going on TV anymore besides basically getting patted on the head and being called a genius. That's all he cares about. He just needs to go away. There's just this, and, and, and by the way, I know this is going to be shocking, but there is a generation of pundits and strategists and politicians and business people and you name it who just can't stop. They just can't stop. They can't let anybody else come in. They can't let anybody do anything else. And there are a bunch of us who have a lot to say and some skin in the fight. And we just want a chance. And they will not stop. They will not go away. They will not go gentle into that good night. Earl says, how much are you willing to bet Biden's agenda is over? No voting rights, no uh, reconciliation bill, maybe something minor on pre-K and child care tax credit, nothing more on climate or control of cops. Um, $500 says nothing more. Um, the problem here, and, and I kind of feel like that this is one, one of the things that's happening here is you got to do something like you got to do something there's got to be some type of conversation that's taking place the social safety net stuff is probably going to take up the next couple of year or years oh my god the next couple of weeks maybe the next month uh after that you might see some sort of reform with the police maybe something small but not very very large um yeah, you might see some nibbling around the edges there. At some point or another, I have to imagine that um, Biden has to say something about voting rights. I got to imagine that at some point or another, Biden has to say something or push something on voting rights. I don't know what that will be. I don't know how it will work. I don't know what the conversation will look like. But I think that there has to be something. There has to be something that ends up getting pushed there. Uh, that would be my bet. I don't think the agenda is over. I think that that, I think that that more or less would not just be a capitulation. I think that would be a surrender. And I don't, I don't think this administration is going to give up after one year. I, I, I think that they've got stuff on the board. Uh, climate change, Whew. climate change, something's got to happen there. Dorothy, Dorothy says, do I think Biden will get a worse rap than Carter got? I, I, I think that the media is trying really, really hard to position Joe Biden as a Jimmy Carter type figure. I, 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 I've been thinking that a lot recently, that that is the way that they are trying to line this thing up. Uh, originally, they tried to position him, of course, with, um, you know, this like modern day FDR, uh, which was absurd. He was never going to be an FDR. Biden was always a centrist politician and has moved a little bit left as the years have changed, but not very much. Um, but yeah, the media has definitely tried to position Biden as a Jimmy Carter. I think that's, I think that's absolutely accurate. Liberal malcontent says, will liberals and Democrats ever talk values plainly, starkly, directly instead of substituting policy and positions? They seem to believe voters are already on the same page uh, regarding values and so move on to policy specifics. Man, I, I hope so. I hope that the Democratic Party can come together. I, and again, I'm not a Democrat. And one of the reasons I'm not a Democrat is because the Democratic Party embraced neoliberalism uh, in the 1980s, 1990s. I, I caucus with the Democrats, I guess you would say, because I'm not a Republican. And I think the Republican Party is an existential threat. If, if they could go back to what they used to be, which was a uh, party that stood up for people of color, who stood up for women, who stood up for LGBTQ people, who stood up for labor unions and the working person, that'd be great. But they have to rediscover that. Now, I will say that I do think that Biden understands that. I don't know that he's going to act on that. And I think the progressives want to act on that. But there is the question is whether or not you can pry the Democratic Party out of the hands, out of the, the clutched fingers of neoliberalism. Neoliberalism can't keep going. It just can't. It, it has reached a point where it has lost all momentum. 
it has reached a point where it has no energy in and of itself, and it's simply surviving because the system that it created is a self-sustaining system. Something has to change. Something. And that something might be that the Republican Party realizes its authoritarian nature and we suddenly have to roll against that. <laughs> and, and, and at that point, I mean, things get weird and things could get very, very bad. But I would much rather that the Democratic Party realize that neoliberalism is a, um, it's an empty pit. There's nothing else there. And they need to do it. I mean, never underestimate the Democratic Party's inability to understand future and trends. But you got to think at some point or another, you got to stand up and look in the mirror and understand what's going on. So I, I hope. And that's exactly what they need to do. They need to be able to express and communicate some sort of a value or worldview. Something that, um, you know something that they can promise people and hopefully lead us into the future to do. That'd be great. And by the way, if they did that, they would absolutely wipe the floor with the Republican party who has absolutely nothing to offer but besides fear mongering. And it's, you know, um, going after, um, it's going after the people that they could actually be messaging. It's, it's, it's actually, and they, they just say, what are we supposed to do? We'll go this route. So they, they could, if they embrace that and they had some sort of a vision for the future, it would actually help. Uh, Matthias, what are your hopes regarding possible political decisions in the U S in the coming year? And do you think any of the big organizers of the insurrection will face court? So my guess at this point is that there will be some sort of a sacrificial lamb among the January 6th organizers. I don't know who that would be. Um, Bannon is a possibility, but I don't see that happening. I, I, I think, to be frank with you, because this is bourbon talk and some drinks booze and talking to some people that I hang out with and, 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 and trust, um, if Bannon is the person who's held... Uh, held accountable in this situation. I, I, I actually think that people understand that that could lead to violence. Doesn't mean that he shouldn't be. Doesn't mean that we shouldn't be a situation where Biden shouldn't be, or uh, Biden, that Bannon shouldn't be punished for what he has done. Um, but I mean, personally, if, if I was on the January 6th commission, if I was part of the Democratic Party, I mean, I would I would be talking about everybody who brought people in. I'd be talking about the, the Republican uh, representatives who were meeting with these people. They aren't saying anything. They aren't talking about this. The Democratic Party isn't coming out and saying that the Republican Party is turned into an existential threat, which they absolutely are. It's delusional to pretend like they're not and also self-defeating. So, do I think anybody will be held accountable? Uh, I don't know. I, I would guess probably not. I, I would guess, as, as I was talking about the January 6th uh, commission, I, I think that probably you're not going to see any of these big fish fried. Um, what are my hopes? My hopes, again, are that the people on the left... Um, start to understand who they should be and how they should be messaging and the direction they should be moving in. But I will tell you that my actual real hope is with the people and not just the people who are here. And by the way, that is, uh, that is you know, part of my faith here is that a lot of the people who I talk to now and interact with and people who are part of the, the muckrake community or who come and hang out at the bourbon talks and stuff like that, I, I gain a lot of hope from you all. I also gain a ton of hope from these people going on strike. I gain a, a ton of hope from the people who tell their jobs to, you know, kiss their ass. Like, I'm not doing this job anymore. You can't mistreat me. You can't exploit me anymore. Those things, those things give me hope. Because I have to tell you that the people who are in power are not going to wake up one day and suddenly decide to do what's right. The reason that they are in power in the first place is because they can put their finger up and feel the, where the winds are going. They'll come around if they feel like there is a grassroots uprising of people who expect more. They'll do things if all of a sudden they realize we're not going to simply just give them our votes because they have a D next to their name. That's bullshit. 
And as long as the Democratic Party has a monopoly over people's votes and they're not worried about those things, that's a problem. What needs to happen is a grassroots movement that will make the people in power feel accountable, or we can get some of our own people in there who will actually have a conscience. Now, that being said, that's where my hope is. And my hope right now is in the fact that there is gaining momentum among the labor movement and among the grassroots movement. Those things give me hope. And so I don't think that this is going to simply go away. I think we probably, and this is something to go ahead and start thinking about, I think as we get near Christmas, and as you're not going to find a lot of seasonal work, a lot of people who are going to go in and work at these either uh, distribution centers or retail stores or restaurants, I think things are going to feel a little, uh, a little crunched. I think that the holidays are going to feel a little weird this year, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. It might feel like things are starting to come apart or like, you know, the, the framework is starting to sort of shift or, or, or crumble, but that's not actually what's happening. I think what's actually going to end up happening is that the labor movement is going to translate into things changing. And I have hope there. I have a lot of hope, actually. And for those of you who have tuned in, we've been doing this for, um, I don't know, a couple years now? Is that how long Bourbon Talk's been going on? I don't even, uh, I don't actually remember when we started doing this. That's weird. But, you know, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to tell you that I have hope when I don't. I have hope in this, in, in the momentum coming together. I, I think it's there, and I think we're, we're watching things change. I do. Uh, Carlos, I read the Substack post on the relationship between fascism and capitalism. Can you get into the mindset that makes this possible, both from the fascist and the capitalist side, because it's incredibly hard for me to go there? All right. We've got eight minutes until the one hour mark, so I'm going to try and answer this one within that time frame. So over at, um, what's the URL? Jared Yates Sexton substack.com. That's where dispatches from a collapsing state is. Uh, and again, thank you, everybody at, in the Bourbon Talk universe. Somebody said I saw that um, for telling me that I should go ahead and open up a Substack where I can post this stuff. It has been a lifesaver. It has been a really, really good outlet to get some of this work done. Uh, if you haven't read it yet, I basically put together um, this tweet thread that I had written about fascism being an emergency weapon of capitalism. And then I annotated it and got uh, more in depth over there at, uh, at my Substack. So if you haven't seen it, you should. Uh, so what I have discovered in my research is that there is a moment where um, there is a dissatisfaction. And, and this is, this is, a, 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 a natural sort of a situation that occurs with capitalism. So the inherent contradiction of capitalism is that you need people who are able to buy things in order to keep consumerism rolling and, and able to, to keep the system going. But as the concentration of wealth moves towards the wealthy and the powerful, and as they start taking over more and more money, and as they dominate the labor market and people pay people less and less, they can't buy things. So this is always a problem. And as those wealthy and powerful control the country, our lives get worse and our conditions get worse and we get more and more frustrated. And we, we at some point or another, there's a point where we say, you know, there's only so much shit I will eat. I'm done. And eventually, if things don't get better, and by the way, that's what happened with FDRs. He said, you know what, like, I'm not a socialist, but you need to do something to make people's lives better or else they're going to become communist or they're going to become fascist. So we have to give them something in order to, like, make this system work. Right. In this case, uh, what ends up happening is that the wealthy and powerful, uh, they have no interest whatsoever in giving up any kind of, of wealth or power. So basically any sort of reform, even if it's just in their best interest, they see it as some sort of a conspiracy to take power and wealth from them. So immediately what they do is they turn to fascists. 
they turn to paramilitary groups. They turn to people who are willing to go out and fight socialist and communist and reformers and labor unions. That they'll go out there and they'll beat people up. They'll kill people. They'll leave them bleeding in the street. And they'll make sure that people go to work. Now, in America, the American dream tells us that if we go to work and if we work hard and if we put our nose to the grindstone and we are dedicated, that eventually we will be recognized and will be lifted up. Now, that meritocratic promise is a complete and utter lie. It's a mythology that has been created. It goes all the way back to Plato, but we don't have time to get into that because we're trying to get this answer in before we get to the hour mark. So what ends up happening is that the fascists come in and you have to figure out a way to get people to work. And by the way, in the midst of this great resignation and this labor struggle, you're seeing a lot of people are saying, I don't want to go to work. I don't want to be exploited and treated terribly. Well, the fascists go out and they make sure that you're going to go to work because if you don't, they will bust your skull open or they'll kill you and they'll kill your family. So what ends up happening is that capitalism sort of hollows out the human experience. And eventually the only thing that matters is that you are putting out products and you are helping the pursuit of profits. So eventually what happens is you look up and you're like, am I a cog in a wheel? Like, what is the meaning here? Like there's nothing spiritual. There's nothing here that makes me feel rewarded or respected. There's nothing that gets me out of bed in the morning. What is happening here? Is this really just about putting out products? And it is. And eventually the fascists come out and they say, no, that's not all there is. What you are doing by going to work, by being exploited, by getting out of bed in the morning, is that you are participating in a holy ceremony. Because what is holy is not God. What is holy is not some sort of a faith-based system. What is holy is not sort of the experience of being a human. What is holy is the state. It's the country. And so what you are doing by sacrificing your well-being, by not getting paid as much, by going along with what they tell you to do, you're not actually capitulating. You're not surrendering. You're not a weakling. You're strong. And you are part of a larger movement. And so what fascists do is they make our suffering religious. They make us martyrs in the cause of the state. I don't matter. You don't matter. They don't matter. What matters is that we go to the work and we do what we're doing because it helps the state. And eventually what happens with fascists is that they make holy the idea of war. Not only the war that we fight amongst one another, which is what the Republican Party is doing right now and rising authoritarianism is doing right now, but if you tell people that they need to sacrifice, they need to go to work, they need to take lower wages, all of that if all of that takes place, don't worry, we're going to go to war because the state is holy. They're not holy, they're dangerous, and they're out to hurt you. And that's what the conspiracy theories are about. They go ahead and they make what we do the holy sacrament, the martyrdom of, of a religious idea of state. And the next thing you know, you go to war and it's self-destruction because fascism is collective suicide. It is self-destruction. It is. It, it doesn't work. It's taking a system that burns itself out and tries to make it something that is perpetual through that violence and through the struggle of fascism. So what happens is when the capitalism, or in particular hyper-capitalism and the contradictions of capitalism come to bear, the fascists go out in the street and they make sure that you go to work and they make sure you go to work through violence and intimidation, but they also go ahead and tell you that what you're doing is holy and good and worthy. And you absolutely do matter. Because the solution on all of this, the solution on all of this is that we have inherent worth. We're worth more than our jobs. We're worth more than our country. We're worth more than any of this nonsense. We have inherent worth. And on top of that, we're told that we can't trust people, that we can't have faith in one another, that we're currently in an economic competition to the death, and it's not true. It is the framework that keeps us in this system of suffering. You absolutely matter. You really, really, truly do. And this entire system of oppression 
is supposed to make you feel like you don't matter and that you don't have power, but you do matter and you do have power. That is my rant before we get to one hour. I still have some questions, but um, really appreciate you hanging out. Y'all are the best. Really, really, truly appreciate this. Um, always enjoy getting into the into, into the heart of this stuff. I appreciate you dealing with me. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1 to defeating fascism and authoritarianism. Into mattering. Into mattering. Eventually, we're going to look up, and I truly believe this, eventually we're going to look up and we're going to say, I can't believe we lived like that. I believe that. I think at some point we're going to look back on this time period and we're going to say, I cannot believe that we were exploited like that. I cannot believe we were lied to like that. I cannot believe that we were taken advantage of like that. I truly believe that. I do. And I understand that like a lot of what I talk about on here and in my books and on the podcast and, 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 and Twitter or whatever, I understand that a lot of the stuff that I talk about sounds very dire sometimes, but that's only because we are in a position of, of, of crisis and, and the matter is important, but I have hope. I think that we are going to see a major change in our lives. I think I, 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 I think if somebody were to come back right now from the future and tell us about what we're getting ready to see, I, I think we would be shocked because that's how history works. And this stuff goes in cycles. It is not static. We're not going to spend the rest of our lives feeling like this. And I have faith in the human spirit to overcome this. And we have choices to make and we have battles to fight and we have, we have paths to choose. And I think we're going to make the right ones because I don't think that, I don't think humanity is wicked. I don't think humanity is fallen. I don't think that humanity needs to be redeemed. I think we're good. I think this system brings out the worst in us because we have to live through it. On this note, Ross said, what was your bright spot this week? And this is one of the reasons why I believe that. Uh, it was my students. My students are fantastic. My students are incredibly kind human beings who take care of one another. And they will not stand for people treating their friends and acquaintances and the people they know poorly. They will not suffer it. I think generationally, like we are seeing a change in terms of how people approach things. My grandparents were part of the greatest generation and they believe that the entirety of existence was about sacrifice. It's about going to work. It was about going to war. It was about fighting fascism. You know, they didn't get educated. They didn't have big dreams. Their kids in the baby boom generation, they were told that they deserved more, but also they had like the lingering, um, the lingering doubt about whether or not they deserved more. And then eventually, as they got older, they had to sort of suffer an identity crisis based on trying to live up to who they were and their principles, particularly in the 1960s and 1970s, which in a lot of ways they failed with. My generation, uh, I am right in the middle of Generation X and uh, the millennial generation, uh, you know, we're trying to figure it out. And we're trying to make our own way, even though a lot of the bridges we were supposed to cross have absolutely been on fire. This next generation just doesn't put up with a lot of shit, but they're very kind. And, you know, I've had, we're, we're late in the semester, uh, which is really hard. It's a really, really hard time uh, trying to get everything done. For me, um, you know, I'm trying to, trying to bring my classes in for a landing while also I am in the midst of writing the most difficult book that I could ever imagine writing. And I, I have to get it done, uh, by January, uh, later January, and I am going to be working around the clock for it. And, it's amazing how kind my students have been, the things that they've said to me, um, the, the support that they've given me. Um, 
my job is rough. Being a professor in the United States of America, particularly in a quote unquote red state in a time where uh, academics are treated like shit and authoritarianism is rising, it's not the easiest occupation in the world. Um, but man, they're very, very kind. So my bright spot this week was the kindness of, of my students. That was the bright spot. Uh, Lionel says, how in the hell do we make ourselves heard? We need to demand accountability. We make ourselves heard by engaging in the process. We make ourselves heard by expecting more. We make ourselves heard by demanding what we deserve, which is more. Politics is not spectacle. Politics is not a Greek mythology battle of the gods that we watch on high and hope that they make the right decisions while we comment on the battle on social media. That's not what this is. Um, the Republican Party understands this incredibly well. They have taken the fight not just in, um, in the states. Uh, they are now at school boards. We have to be there. We have to make the hard choices. We have to put in the time. We have to make in. We have to put in the effort, the civic responsibility. Some of us have to run for government. Some of us have to work to get people that we trust in government. Besides that, we have to build solidarity. We have to rebuild trust that has been destroyed on purpose. We have been told over and over and over again that we are all economic competitors. We're not. That's not how this works. It's not a limited pie that we all have to fight over. Who gets even a fraction of a slice? It's not true. So how do we get heard? We get heard by getting in the game. We get heard by telling people what we want and demanding what we deserve. And we deserve so much more than this. So much more than this. Henry says, I thought the muckrake segment on China was a lot. Do you think a new Cold War is inevitable? No, I don't think it's inevitable. Uh, if you haven't heard it already, Nick and I talked. That must have been on the weekend or on Friday. Uh, go over to uh, patreon.com slash muckrake podcast. Uh, that helps us and keeps us going, and we appreciate it like you wouldn't believe. We were talking on Friday about how uh, a lot of these um, – military industrial complex people are pushing really, really hard for a cold war. And, you know, a lot of what we're talking about right now, a cold war goes ahead and cuts that off. You don't have to pay for social projects and human projects and infrastructure. If you're fighting a cold war, all that money just gets channeled from the bottom up because we have to defend the country. Don't you know, they've got hypersonic missiles. They're going to destroy us. There's going to be a third world war, which is all bullshit. So no, I don't think that a cold war or war with China is inevitable. We can say no. Every war has a moment where the people can say no. It's when we feel that it's inevitable. It's when we are told it's inevitable. It's when we accept that it's inevitable. That we can't possibly do anything besides watch it on TV. So no, it is not inevitable. And we should not accept this. And I am not a China apologist. China has a lot of problems. But I will point out that all the problems that China has, the Western powers like the United States of America and the United Kingdom, they have looked to China and they said, that looks pretty good. We like the way that you control your people. We like the way that you surveil your people. We might want to get in on that. The problem is not with the Chinese people. The problem is with these nation states that exploit people and oppress people. But no, a cold war is not necessary, nor is it inevitable. Break in window says, how does a general strike serve as a tool against fascism or does it? It does. Uh, the idea of a general strike right now, uh, and, and in America and around the world, a general strike has been something that has always been discussed as a possibility is the main way that quote unquote normal people can actually hold leverage over the process. In the United States of America, we're a long ways away from that. If people want to move towards a general strike, then they need to get behind something like the international workers or they need to get behind some sort of a big union. Because the one thing that has happened is that all these labor unions have been used as cudgels against one another. So at this point, the question is, what do we want to move towards? 
Now, all of this labor discontent is a possibility. It is something that could hold some sort of a lever leverage moving forward, but it would take something very, very large. And America currently is not in a position to have a major general strike, but that does not mean that there isn't a possibility. In fact, we have seen in America that we've gotten very, very close to general strikes. We've seen industries be completely shut down. And that is a possibility and, and should always be uh, an arrow in the quiver. Janelle uh, asked me if I'd heard about this, which is that uh, in the last 24 hours, there have been bomb threats at Yale, Cornell, and Miami University. Uh, I think there's been a couple of others since then. This is what happens in a culture war. This is what happens when a piece of shit like J.D. Vance says that professors are the enemy. This is what happens when a Republican Party that is an authoritarian movement uh, goes after intellectuals and so-called left and education. That's what's going on. There's going to be a whole lot more of this. And in the future, it's not going to be bomb threats. It's going to be either bombs, shootings, violence, something or another. And I don't say that to be alarmist. I say that to prepare you because the more that this happens and the more that they turn up the heat, the more possibility there is for this type of stuff. It's really awful. It's really awful what they've done. And I, I have to tell you, and I don't know, I, I, I don't know how else to say it. Maybe, maybe I'm the only professor that you hear. Maybe I'm the only professor that you see. Maybe I'm the only professor that, you know, is, is a regular in your life. But you need to hear me when I say this, which is that the academy has been under attack for a very long time. It's not just about budgets. It's not just about CRT. There's been a full scale assault on higher education for a lot of different reasons that we can't necessarily get into right now. But it has gone on and it is dangerous and it's getting more and more dangerous every single day. It's really awful, really, really disgusting and awful. And I want to point out very, very quickly um, that, you know, this is this is a signpost of fascism. It truly is. They go after the press. They go after academics. They go after vulnerable populations. And then they take over society and whole. But that's what they do. That's how it always works. And that's what's happening right now. Uh, finally, from Mugwump, the Big Bird thing. This is getting beyond silly, but I guess on purpose. It's absolutely on purpose. Uh, Big Bird, who I've always loved. I've always had a soft spot in my heart for Big Bird ever since I was a little kid. What a what a what a sweet little creature, big creature, I suppose. Big Bird is. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's not a coincidence. They're going after Big Bird and cartoons and and Potato Head and Dr. Seuss and all that. It's all childish. And, and basically what they're going to push over the next couple of years, and this is what the CRT thing has absolutely crystallized. It's going to be about children. It's going to be about claiming that the left is hurting children, that the left is indoctrinating children. It strikes some sort of a, of, of a chord within the conservative community that is there that also, and remember this for the future, and I'll talk more about this um, uh, a future episode or a podcast or a Substack or whatever, a large part of this has to do with the economic frustration and anger that comes from college, which is that only certain people get to go and other people are left behind in the economy. And even people who go to college occasionally will get left behind. So a large part of what's happening here is that they are venting a lot of this anger when it comes to education around this idea of you know who gets to get ahead and who doesn't and all that and so as a result they're picking all this bullshit stuff and you know it's just outrageous that's all there is uh cyborg manifesto says do i think there will be pockets of the u.s that will be safe from fascism at first yeah i do um you know i think there will be some uh some strongholds here and there but i think there's a real possibility that you know, if there's going to be some sort of uh, civil violence, it's probably going to be widespread. And you're probably going to see something along the lines of cosmopolitan areas that we would call safe spaces or pockets um, probably be attacked at some point or another by asymmetrical violence. Uh, but the problem is going to be 
what happens with climate change when all of a sudden borders start giving way. Because when you start losing territory and you start having populations move from one place to another, and you got to remember that the people who are going to be really, really affected by cl climate change are mostly going to be the impoverished and people of color. All of a sudden, you're going to see a lot of movement, a lot of violence, and a lot of negotiations of space and politics and law that um, we can't even begin to imagine at this point. So things are going to change. But I have to tell you that I think that whatever ends up happening, whether it's good or it's bad, it's going to be widespread and sweeping. Um, I don't think we're going to see a breakup of the United States in terms of affiliated states, probably in our lifetimes, unless something really, really bad happens. And in that case, best of luck, everybody. All right. I, uh, I appreciate you so much. And I appreciate that you hang out and um, that you 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 hear these warnings that I talk about, but also allow me some space to be hopeful. I'm 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 hopeful. I actually truly am. These are rough times, and they are trying the soul. Um, I'm tired, but I gain a lot of energy and hope from you, and uh, I am eternally grateful as always. Uh, I'll be back with the Monk Creek Podcast on Tuesday. I'll have a new Substack this week. Um, if you haven't already, go over to patreon.com slash podcast to support the podcast, jrdhsexton.substack.com uh, to subscribe to Dispatches from the Collapsing State. Uh, also, American Rule paperback is out there. I'm hearing a lot of good things from people who are giving it to uh, their parents and their their brothers and, and their relatives. Apparently, it's uh, it's helping out some people. So American Rule paperback is out there. I'm going to be hanging out, uh, working on a new book, basically around the clock. Those geese are going to be um, heading on somewhere else. And so am I. Cheers to the eventual defeat of fascism, which will happen. Cheers. All right. Be good, everyone. Be safe. <laughs>